introduce you as you enjoy your lunches to Jimmy Dawkins. Uh, Jimmy has been with American Farmland Trust for a really long time, since 1997. And um, he's been managing national policy campaigns and projects. And currently, Jimmy directs AFT's Agriculture and Environment Program, helping farmers and ranchers improve water quality and combat climate change while remaining economically viable. Uh, through that, Jimmy works with the U.S. Climate Alliance states alongside some of our other staff at AFT, and that's going to be really the chief topic of his conversation. So we started off at our in our neighbor at Ma in Massachusetts. We brought ourselves back to New York. Now we're going to zoom out. We'll stay zoomed out, and then we'll come back in to New York, and then zoom way into Long Island. Um, so that's really the way that the rest of the day is going to go. Um, so, without further ado, I will introduce you all to Jimmy Dawkins. Thank you very much, Samantha. Really close to your mouth. Really close to my mouth, like that. Uh, okay, let's see if this if it works that way. Okay, um, I'm going to try to make up some time here. So, uh, for a while, I'm going to speak kind of fast and <laughs> just give you the, the the header, the message of, on, on some of the uh, on some of the slides. Uh, David and Emily gave you a little bit of a intro on AFT. Uh, Kara gave you the sort of legislative context. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of the um, climate context into which uh, we're all having these discussions, um, and then also, as um, as Samantha said, um, just talk about some of the state action and the U.S. Climate Alliance uh, work of which uh, New York State is um, part of that. So, okay, so we can go. New York no farms, no food. We now say no farms, no food, no future. We think that sustainable agriculture, sustainable farming is needed for our, uh, our future. AFT, holistic approach, three uh, areas of our mission, the land side, the practices, and the, and the people. As it relates to climate change, though, we um, look at a uh, sort of three-pronged uh, approach. Um, and so what we're looking at is protecting our farmland and uh, promoting compact growth as a significant climate strategy, um, improving soil health um, uh, to help reverse uh, climate change, and then the third, uh, expanding renewable energy um, uh, on our uh, ag land. So those are the, sort of the three areas which would help us to mitigate and uh, adapt uh, to climate change. Um, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe this, but you know we have a climate crisis. Um, that's why we're all here. Uh, farmers and ranchers are going to be on the front line um, of this with a weather-dependent industry. This affects their livelihood in a way that it doesn't for most others. And so this is a really big issue for agriculture uh, in a way that most other people, unless they live uh, in low-lying sea areas, just don't see yet. Um, and uh, this is all happening in the context of a time when the ag uh, economy is hurting, especially for dairy. So you've already heard several speakers talking about that issue. How do we think about climate change, which is going to make agriculture you know, more challenging, um, and how do we think about that with, a, uh, with an economy that is, um, is a real challenge, and that makes uh, the land, from our point of view, AFT, vulnerable to uh, conversion. And it also makes that third part of our mission, that keeping farmers on the land, the ag economic viability, really important, which is why you heard um, uh, speakers earlier talking about being able to do both, right? Pursue the solar opportunity for ag economic viability while protecting um, our, uh, our best uh, ag land. So last year, uh, the IPCC uh, um, uh, 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 issued a report that said, and most of you know this, right, but climate change goals can't be achieved just by reducing greenhouse gases alone, right? We need to do more. We need to draw down. We need to sequester uh, uh, carbon um, out of uh, the atmosphere. And we don't have that much time, right? You know, somewhere 10, 12 years, we, get, we need to act now. Um, I will say that... Um, there's been a big change in how we think about natural and working lands um, uh, solutions and that involvement in battling climate change. Just from 12 or 18 months ago, um, 
there wasn't a lot of discussion. Part of the effort was to try to get that into the discussions, uh, into the climate discussion. Some of the research that um, uh, has been done uh, and released in the last couple of years has raised and elevated this, um, uh, showing the potential for natural and working lands. This is uh, uh, the Joe Fargioni report that some others here have been part of. Peter Woodbury was a part of that large team. And that's really changed the debate and raised the uh, elevation. But I will say that just one year ago when uh, we had the Global Climate Summit, agriculture didn't quite make it into the Global Climate Summit. The Secretary of Ag in, uh, in uh, uh, California had a separate side meeting to, uh, to focus just on ag issues. So it was sort of a side meeting, not quite at the big table. That's all um, changed, I think, a lot. So this is natural and working lands, um, um, which is uh, forests and wetlands and, uh, and, a and ag lands. But it showed that this can be a significant climate, uh, have a significant impact on uh, the uh, climate uh, challenge. We believe that farming done right can be a carbon sink and can counter emissions from other sectors. So what you uh, uh, heard before, uh, the previous slide was natural and working lands, and we're, we're gonna focus more on, um, on ag lands. Um, and um, you know, we believe that agriculture lands offer um, immediate, proven, low-cost solutions, right? Which is a big deal, right? Because a lot of the things that we're talking about in, uh, uh, um, uh, we, we, we heard that we're in process in New York and trying to figure some of this stuff out. But there's a lot of things in agriculture that have already uh, been proven on the ground, and we just need to increase uh, uh, adoption uh, of that. And so I just say again that we believe that there's no other strategy uh, to combat climate change that yields as many of the co-benefits that our society needs for a sustainable future as if we can figure this out, if we can solve it on ag lands. To be able to produce food and to get climate uh, sequestration or reducing greenhouse gases. I think that's it. Now, this is all happening in the context of losing ag land, right? And so AFT uh, uh, issued a report last, uh, uh, last uh, year, 25 million acres from uh, 82 to 2015. This is a map of the uh, loss of uh, ag land. You can see up in the Northeast, uh, the colors show you, you know, just visually uh, what's happened. This is the conversion of ag land. And what we found is that most of it is due to low density uh, residential development, that kind of, you know, so we, we think of urban sprawl, but a lot of this is a little more invisible, the fragmentation in this low density um, uh, uh, sprawl. But in addition, there is an increasing competition for land, right? We want to talk about this not just as the threat from development, but there's an increasing demand for services from our ag lands. And I think you heard that in some of the questions of, uh, uh, Peter asked about, uh, about forest land and on ag lands, what else can we be doing for them? So there's actually an increase in demand. Jerry uh, talked about it in terms of uh, regional and local food systems. So we want, actually want more land in ag if we're gonna increase in the Northeast our, um, uh, our uh, eating from you know, uh, uh, regional food systems. There's more demand for um, carbon sequestration on ag lands and other kinds. There's a lot of those, a lot of those uh, uh, projections on the potential for carbon sequestration look to reforest some land, look to add buffers, look to uh, expand wetlands, which all makes sense, but that's an, another increasing demand, an environmental, in this case, uh, uh, demand. And then lastly, because of the whole issue that we're talking about today, is renewable energy on those uh, ag lands. Uh, you're, you already heard, you know, and you already know, New York's uh, uh, taking the lead, but there's a lot of action at the state level that's, inc uh, that's uh, uh, incredibly exciting, uh, has me uh, really uh, uh, invigorated in working in this area, because for a while we didn't have a lot as much going on and didn't think there was anything going on at the federal level. Some states were doing things. That has changed in just, you know, say 24 months. Um, and that's really good news. The states have uh, filled that gap with the federal uh, government stepping away and pulling out of the uh, Paris uh, uh, Accord. You just see these states being very active and New York being one of the leaders. You heard the mo just passed the most ambitious you know, single uh, uh, piece of, uh, uh, of climate legislation. Um, one of the things that AFT thinks about as we've been looking at this opportunity is this is a little mantra that I've had in, internally is we need to get uh, uh, natural and working lands up into state 
climate policy, right? It wasn't, and now I think it is more and more so. Um, from our point of view, even within natural working lands, we want to get agriculture in a seat at the table because a lot of it was about forestry and uh, reforestation and a lot of the projections in terms of the total amount of carbon that you can sequester. But we want ag at the table because we think that's important. And then sort of the last thing is we as an organization focused on the, the conversion of farmland. We want to get farmland protection and smart growth seen as a climate strategy. You'll see uh, in, a, in a moment, Almost every one of these states have um, farmland protection programs. Very few of them think of them as a climate uh, 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 strategy. Uh, so US Climate Alliance, um, 24 states and Puerto Rico, so 25 governors committed their states to the Paris Accord, right, to achieving the, uh, to achieving the, uh, uh, the goals, the 26 to 28% uh, reduction. Now, many states have gone beyond that. So California, New York, and Hawaii have made even more ambitious. Um, but uh, these are the uh, 25 uh, states. And one of the key things is um, with these lighter green, these are the new ones that came in after the 2018 uh, election. And that changed the map a little bit, which was very exciting because you got a lot more of the Southwest and these uh, uh, Midwest uh, uh, states and really strengthened. It's a bipartisan, purple states, bipartisan. You got uh, Maryland uh, has a Republican governor. And um, so um, uh, these states, though, represent, I think it's 55% of the population, 60% of the uh, GDP. So this is a lot. This is a big commitment of states that are working on this. And so one of the things that um, they did was they saw that there was a real opportunity for natural and working lands. It was a near-term, immediate opportunity that they wanted to take advantage of. Um, and so they created an initiative just on the natural and working lands um, and to try to have the uh, states uh, be sharing and um, advancing these kinds of, um, of policies. Um, they issued a challenge, a national and uh, work, excuse me, natural and working lands challenge, which committed them to. Um, and I really, most of it's pretty uh, similar. But the very last thing that I'll, uh, that I'll say is that challenge, and most of the states have signed on. Some of the new states haven't, but um, signed on to um, integrating actions and pathways into state GHG mitigation plans by 2020. That's next year. Um, U.S. Climate Alliance um, uh, said, wow, we really need to try to share ideas and provide some technical assistance to the states. And so um, this impact partnership was uh, created. Six NGOs um, working on um, forestry issues, inventory climate issues, and ag issues to try to support the states, try to facilitate the sharing across states, try to identify some case studies and innovations, um, try to help the states leapfrog and, um, and advance this uh, quicker. And we're very happy and honored to be uh, part of that. And it's a very, very exciting um, um, sort of effort uh, cross uh, states and then cross uh, the NGOs. Um, so from my point of view, uh, this is a little more my point of view, but I just want to try to sort of uh, give you a framework for uh, uh, state climate plans. Um, building off existing conservation programs. Um, there's a lot of conservation programs that exist. New York has great programs for for water quality, how do you build off of those water quality programs that are state, and then also how do you um, integrate and leverage the Farm Bill? Uh, because the Federal Farm Bill provides a lot of the uh, money for these programs. As I said, including farmland protection, creating a healthy soils program, what you see in just a second is most states don't have a healthy soils program. They have programs that give cost share for many of the practices, but not specifically for healthy soils. Sometimes the criteria are a little bit different. Um, quantifying, I want to talk a little bit more about that and how important that is, and reporting on GHG impacts as they relate to natural and working lands or ag lands. Uh, investing in technical assistance, right? It's not going to happen if it's uh, not being supported on the ground. Developing new sources of funding, which is always the sort of Achilles heel of this, right? We, we wish we had more money, and then how are you going to get more money? And then lastly, you guys all know, because we're doing this expanding renewables. And I'm focused on land. There is another initiative within the US Climate Alliance and others working on this that's focused on livestock and manure and methane issues. So I'm just focused on that 
many of these things apply to those issues because those are enormous uh, portions of the ag footprint and have real opportunities also for uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gases. So this is something that we did for the U.S. Climate Alliance and we're looking at the number of programs that are at state, uh, that are already, uh, uh, that already exist at the state level. And as you can see, healthy soils as a, as a, as a, as a specific pro, uh, program is not that many, right? You know, And so most of the states are looking at these programs and saying, really what I need to do is figure out how to utilize and leverage and complement, right? Not just cannibalize, but complement my water quality programs. So all the states in the Chesapeake Bay and others are, are trying to talk about that. That's a real key issue, trying to figure out how to do state climate policy as it relates to uh, agriculture. And again, I said this before, but farmland protection uh, is something that exists, but um, they haven't really been seen as a uh, climate. One of the things we're doing with uh, the Coalition on Ag Greenhouse Gases is trying to pull some of this stuff together to provide it to states so states know what's going on in other states, try to highlight some of the um, uh, case studies of innovative programs, and, um, and try to just be a technical resource uh, 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 to the states. And so some of that ought to be coming out um, this winter, early next year, and it will be available to other uh, uh, states as well, but hopefully um, you know, we're, we're, we're here to serve those U.S. Climate Alliance uh, uh, states. I'm gonna go through this quickly. I just want you to, uh, to know that California, we did some research in California to help make the case that farmland protection and smart growth can be a climate strategy. That led to the Sustainable Ag Lands Conservation Program, which is a climate program in, the, uh, in California, and it is funded through some of the climate allocation uh, funds. It's now a significant program, so 124 million invested, 90,000 acres protected, and they are calculating the, you know, you know a, a, a way of estimating estimating the GHG impacts for that program. So it's one of the pillars of their program. We actually replicated that research in New York, and Samantha's been working hard with others and partners to try to do that same kind of thing in New York, right? To see that farmland protection and compact growth can be a climate strategy. Um, practices, right? Soil two to three times more than the atmosphere, right? So this is the other big area, right? Um, it has those practices that build soil health have tons of co-benefits. In fact, I just said that most of them we're thinking about them are actually passed and the most cost share is for those other co-benefits. One co-benefit I would like to just uh, highlight is yield stability. So all of these practices, not all these practices, many of these practices also help uh, on, the, on the productivity side and on the yield side. And so they help to, um, um, uh, uh, reduce risk for farmers and can lead to increased profitability. So that gives me a lot of hope in the future about the longevity of these kinds of projects. And, you know, if you get a little cost share, are you going to keep doing it or not? We did some economic case studies um, that showed the um, reduction in greenhouse gases, the improvement or reduction in uh, nutrients losing, uh, leaving the farm, and then also the uh, economic, the profitability increase. And so that kind of thing, a lot of it anecdotal because it depends but um, I think that that's a real uh, area of opportunity um, many of you know this but it's lots of practices it's called different things and carbon farming or regenerative and things there are four basic guidelines you keep it covered right cover crops you minimize disturbances you rotate crops and include perennials and you integrate livestock all these Things often I hear people say, well, they're all the same. They're not actually the same. They're sort of a continuum, right? And the more you integrate livestock and you try to do that, there's some, uh, uh, there's some you know, th that's a new practice. Um, but I think there's real opportunities um, uh, uh, here. Um, one of the big policy challenges and one of the things that we hear from states is how, how do I quantify this? How do I get a handle on this? Because if you don't measure it, it's hard to sell it. It's hard to go to the governor's task force when they're saying, how many tons can you give me, right, to help me to meet my um, goal by 2030 or 2050 if I can't measure it? And so this is a big area that the states want. And it's a challenge on the agricultural side because it's a systems, right? So one of the things that AFD is, uh, is doing to help to start the process is building off of the Comet uh, farm model and providing a tool that's going to be available now. And just a sec, I'll tell you, we're already working with some of the states to try to measure and give a first cut of the potential for um, what are your practices doing now? 
Um, if we had 50% more cover crops on all, of our, uh, on all of our land, what might it do? We could get into a whole nother, and there are <laughs> meetings that are just about the quantification and how to improve that. But right now, most states don't do that. California is one that they've been doing that and measuring it for their Healthy Soils program, but other states need to do that, and this is a place to start. How do we improve it? That will be great, and let's do it, but let's at least start the process. Um, and so that's a very exciting uh, uh, thing that's just being rolled out uh, right now as we speak uh, by um, Jen Morcasera, who is the uh, director of our climate hub. State Learning Labs, right now, the U.S. Climate Alliance uh, and the Impact Partners are, are meeting with the states, and we had four regional um, learning labs that are going on right now this fall. Um, one was in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, Mid then in the Midwest. Uh, it's coming up next week in the West. And then the Northeast um, will be in Providence December uh, 4th and 5th. And these are where we're trying to gather the state teams. The, the states will send a team and trying to work and share with the uh, you know, cross state and then also with some of the, you know, the, the impact partners providing information to try to advance their climate plans to help them to try to flesh out that 2020 plan. It's really, I can't tell you how invigorating it is. I mean, it's kind of wonky, but how invigorating it is to be sitting with state teams that are trying to actually work this and figure it out and develop it and then also learning and going, well, wait, wait, how are you doing that? Why can't we do that if they're doing that with their property taxes? Why, why wouldn't it work? work for us. Um, so it's very uh, uh, exciting um, uh, uh, to be doing that. I don't know if I have time to do funding. I got to wrap up. <laughs> this is great because I don't have that much to say about it. <laughs> it's incredibly important. <laughs> Conventional ways, right? We need to pass it. You guys have passed laws to do cost share, right? But it's not enough. It's not enough funding, right? So you need to do federal. You need to do state. Um, but we need uh, bond initiatives. One of the partners uh, is TPL. So TPL and Trust for Public Land and the Nature Conservancy do state and local bond initiatives to try to support you know, land protection, but also getting into potentially um, you know, the practices on that land. The others are environmental markets, right? I, for 20 years, have talked about environmental markets, and people are like, really, huh? Tell me, you know, come back when they're... There's actually a lot of momentum in carbon markets right now um, with uh, the Environmental uh, Service Market Coalition, Indigo, Nori. So with the demand from the airline industry, maybe we are finally at a tipping point where there might be dollars that will actually flow back through to uh, um, uh, landowners to try to provide credits, and that's another source of, uh, of funding. And then also there's a lot of innovations, uh, EDF, uh, Environmental Defense Fund, and um, uh, NASDA, the National Association of Department of Agriculture, just issued a report on state innovative financing programs for these kinds of so soil health programs. Um, and so you see programs like uh, uh, Iowa and Illinois are testing a new way to uh, uh, stimulate cover crops through crop insurance, right? So, so you know, we, we, we often do cost share, and it's at $25 an acre, and Oh, can't we all be Maryland? They do it up to $75 an acre, right? But it's still not happening at fast enough rates. And so part of it is the structure of applying. And so Iowa and Illinois said, well, it, it started in Iowa. Iowa said, look, every, most of the people in the Midwest anyway, the farmers are signed up for uh, crop insurance. What if we use that as a vehicle? Because then they're already there. Let's look at crop in, uh, excuse me, cover crops as a risk reduction strategy. We could have another discussion of <laughs> cover crops used to be seen as risky. Now, now, we see them as a risk reduction, yield stability. Give $5 off the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of discount off of their uh, 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 crop insurance if you use cover crops. So those are the kinds of innovations that um, we're trying to share across, trying to get other states to do that SALK program from California, trying to other, get uh, other states to, uh, to, to uh, advance these. And the states are really interested. You guys are doing some of this work. Uh, it's a very exciting time. If we can figure out how to do it in New York, just be assured that that leverages out to other states and we will change the future if we can be successful in conversations like this and the other ones that are going on uh, uh, around the country. So thank you very much.